our table here for the last several weeks has been covered with little visual reminders of the various stories in the book of Exodus. And so we have worked our way through uh, the stories of, of the waters, the, the baby Moses here in the basket. We've talked about the burning bush that Moses would later uh, encounter. Um, the blood that was placed on the, the doorposts as on that last night of Passover. We talked about the manna in the wilderness. We've talked about all of these stories and the stories of God's people making their way out of that place of captivity and into a new future together. Well, today we arrive uh, at the story that is represented by the, the stone slab. And it is the beginning of the story of the commandments. And these weeks, we recognize these stories of God's people and as people of faith, we believe that we hear echoes of our own stories there as well. And last week, we remember that even after passing through the waters out of captivity and into the new future of following God, that things were not always easy for God's people. It is something for us to remember as well. People became hungry and thirsty. They feared that they would die in the wilderness. They even complained to Moses and wanted to go back to Egypt to the way things used to be, where as bad as those things were, at least they had food to eat. Yet in loving faithfulness, God provided it all that they needed. Manna, and there was quail, and God kept providing it as long as they were in the wilderness. And God told them to keep some of it as a reminder for future generations who might forget how God had taken care of them, as God always does, and as God always will. So this week we find ourselves at Mount Sinai. As God gives the Ten Commandments to Moses to, to take down and give to the people, and we will talk about today the first four of those commandments which focus on our connection to God. It is fitting, too, as we think about how we maintain our connection to God in our own lives and as a community of faith, that we think of how we keep God at the center of our lives. And how God continues to feed us, even now, that this is also World Communion Sunday. So we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. We think about how God, how Christ, how the Spirit feed us through the life of the church. And feed not only us, but people around the world in all their needs. So as we begin worship today, let me begin with a prologue of the commandments. Words that have reminded God's people for generations of why they come to worship. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. God reminds us of who we are. God reminds us of what God has done for us. God reminds us anew as we gather around the table how God has provided for us new life. And friends, that is why we come to worship. So let us stand as we sing again that song that reminds us of an old story and calls us to a new journey. Go down, Moses, which is number 52 in your
since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all live only in the grace of God, which is a gift through Jesus Christ, recognizing then our own sinfulness, but with trust in God's love and grace, let us confess our sin together. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Merciful God, you love us faithfully, and you desire for us to love you and to follow your ways in Jesus. We confess, though, that we have not loved you as we should. We are distracted by many other things. We give our allegiance to other ways and other priorities. Our words and actions are not very Jesus-like. Forgive us and help us again to know the peace of having you at the center of our lives. Amen. Friends, the psalmist wrote, As the heavens are high above the earth, so great is God's steadfast love towards those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far God removes our sins from us.
You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear witness, false witness, against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witness the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. Then the people stood at a distance while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have young folks who would like to join me? Hey, can I come on up? How are you this morning? Hey. Glad to see you. Did you have a good week? Good. Now, um, today this story really reminded me of a question, which is how do we show people that we love them? Do you have any ideas? How do you show somebody that you love them? Be kind. That is a really good idea. Yeah, because sometimes we're not we're not nice to each other, are we? And even people that we love, sometimes we can kind of be mean to them, or we can say things that hurt their feelings. So to show them we love them, we should really be kind. That is a really good one. Um, I also thought about this week. I was out of town all week. I was up in North Carolina, and and one way that I showed like my family that I love them was that I would like text them or call them every day. Um, and we would just like share like how our day went and so just talking to each other uh, when, you, when you're apart. That's, that's a good way of showing somebody you love them. Um, all those kinds of things. Now today, we're really talking about showing God how we love God. And, and that's what all of this, this first part of the Ten Commandments is about is is how, how does God think that we can show our love? And a big one is what we're doing today. We, uh, in the Ten Commandments, it says to keep the Sabbath. Um, for us, that means on Sundays we come to church and we do things like this because it shows God that, that God is important to us and that God is some, some, somebody that we want to be with and spend time with, and so we come to church together. And there are some other ways, too, that we can show God that, that we love God. And, and some of it is things we don't do. Like you said, being, being kind means also we're not mean to somebody that we love. Well, same way with God. So, um, so with God, to show God that, that we love Him, we, we don't do, like, bad things in the name of God, or we don't, like, you know, make other things as important as God is in our lives. And so, in all those ways, in coming to church, we show God that we love Him and that He's important to us. So, that's kind of our lesson today. Just like we show other people we love them in certain ways, we also show God that we love God in certain ways. So, let's say a prayer again. God, we thank you for how much you love us and that you are with us every day and you take care of us and you love us. So God, help us to love you back and to do the things in our lives uh, to show you our love by, by coming to church, by, by sharing your love with other people, and by making you a priority, by showing you how important you are uh, in our lives every week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.
would like to begin with a poem, sort of a poem, by Ann Weeds called, I Celebrate the Church of Jesus Christ. And this is what she writes. I celebrate the church of Jesus Christ, where two or three or thousands can gather together in the Lord's name and touch this world with the amazing good news that somebody cares, that God joins us in community so that someday this world will be loved to wholeness. I celebrate this community where people say yes in the face of no, where they light candles on the darkest night, where healing and compassion leave no time for self-righteousness, and the life-sustaining love of Christ is evident in the life of the believers. I celebrate the church where we are called from half-heartedness to commitment. Commitment to a God who calls us to change, to change our direction, to be reborn to a way of life where others are significant. I cannot live abundantly without the community, God's church, where turning to one another and working and rejoicing with one another is a way of life. A way of life that God chose for us, a gift God gave us, a mission that we share, a mission that cuts across barriers, racial and cultural, national and international, a mission that unites men and women, young and old. I celebrate the Church of Jesus Christ, whose supportive community holds me when I'm tempted to give up enfolds me when I'm hurting, affirms me, reaches out to me, gives to me, receives from me. I celebrate this way of life that takes me and mine from the center of things and focuses on ours and theirs. I celebrate the trust we hold, the spirit we share, the attitude of partnership I celebrate that love lives among us, that God's spirit pervades our being, our community. I see God's face within the lives of these celebrants. I hear God's voice in the vision of men and women who call us to a better way and a higher hope. For God works miracles in common clay pots. We, as God's celebrants, dance through this world together, listening for God's music, responding to God's word, praising God with clapping hands and moving feet, praising God with justice and mercy and humbleness, praising God with changed lives. I think it is important sometimes to remember to remember and even to articulate in our own words, in our own ways, what is at the heart of the community that we call church. And Ann Weems does it better than most. She reminds us of a lot of things which we hold dear. You know, last week we talked about God providing the, the manna in the desert and the quail to feed God's people, to nourish them, to take care of them, feeding them along the way for so many years. Today, then, it is fitting that World Communion Sunday is today, and as we gather around the table, we should be aware, even now, of how God, and now Christ Church, continue to feed us, to nourish us, to maintain our connection to God. It is fitting then, too, that in our journey through Exodus, it leads us next to the Ten Commandments. And our focus for this Sunday today will be about the first 
core, which are really about our connection to God. And we love God, but we are also fed through that connection. We are fed through the life of the church, through the people of God. So it is fitting that we celebrate communion today. God feeds us, and we respond by loving God and keeping God at the center of our lives and at the center of our understanding of life and the world. For the ancient Hebrews, that was sort of focused on these first four commandments. For Jesus, in keeping with the rabbinic teachings of his predecessors for years, he summed it up simply as these four commandments, simply as loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what it really means. That's, that's the first, first whole part of the Ten Commandments. It's really just about loving God. So let me say just a little more about those first four commandments themselves. Looking at them, perhaps, in a little different way than we often do. Patrick Miller once said that the initial statement of the, the Decalogue, Deca means ten, so the Decalogue is the Ten Commandments, he says in the initial statement of the Decalogue, I am the Lord your God, is the foundation stone of the Ten Commandments that follow. That's what these Ten Commandments mean, that, that's what they are in relation to, that's what starts this, is I am the Lord your God. Therefore, it is both, he says, a presentation and a claim. God presents God's self. But the reason for that is not simply that, that, that God is there, that God is around. The reason that God presents God's self as your God is what follows that. I am the Lord your God, the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. That is why I am your God. Not because just God exists, not because some theoretical sense that God's around, but God is our God because of what God has done for us. What God has done for God's people. That is the presentation part of this. And from reading all that we have in the first chapters of Exodus, we realize that God reveals the divine name and the divine nature as the one who hears the cries, the groans, the sufferings of the people who have been enslaved. God's people. And the single ground for identifying the Lord and explaining why that one claims to be your God is the clause who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage. That's why God has a claim upon us. But, Miller says, any understanding that comes out of all of that will have to also go with the story's insistence that the God whose name and nature are so described claims a response. A response from us, from God's people of covenantal obedience as a community. And having once been free, they are commanded to now live in conformity to the ways of God as a community, as God's people. So there's a claim and there's a presentation. I am the Lord your God who led you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. That is why I am your so then the first commandment. Patrick Miller elsewhere noted that this commandment doesn't talk about having another God, but having other gods, plural. And while we may want to reduce it to sort of a, a history of religions question, because that, that gets us off the hook usually as modern day people, and, and we think about, well, Israel wasn't supposed to be polytheistic in their religion. They weren't supposed to be worshiping the gods of the Canaanites or that kind of thing. 
He says the real issue is not about those other local deities. The real issue here is not simply replacing the gods you have with another one, but being attracted by and succumbing to multiple claims on your obedience. And that applies to us today as much as it applied to them. And in modern society, the issue becomes not, not putting other things before God, as if those other things we, we feel in our minds are ahead of God. We, we would never jump to, to that point that other things are more important to God. But the trouble for us modern day folks is putting a lot of other things alongside of God. Not in front of God, but alongside of God. God is still there. God is in the picture. But, but we have other priorities too. We have, we have other allegiances too. And we equate other things with God or with what we think God wants that perhaps shouldn't quite be in that place. We need to be careful about such things. As Miller notes, the Christian or the preacher or the politician who easily invokes the divine name to give authority to their own personal or political beliefs, many of which are unchristlike, treads on this commandment. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways declares the Lord, as it says in Isaiah. We need to be careful about equating our own views about things with God's views. It treads on a commandment. And in the same way, the third commandment, a helpful way of looking at that might be that there are many ways in which either individuals or the community may invoke the name of God we, we, we may not take the name of God as, as in just saying, God, in the middle of a football game when something goes horribly wrong. But we invoke the name of God as a kind of rubber stamp for our own thoughts or practices. We say, this is the godly way of doing something. This is the Christian, the Christian belief in this. This is how Christians should view this. And we need to be careful about throwing those kinds of statements out there. Because we can be taking God's name in vain. And a lot of damage has been done with things that were connected verbally to the way of God. Or this is God's way. Or this is the Christian way. And whatever followed was something that was hurtful and unkind, whatever it may be. We have taken the Lord's name in vain. And finally, a word about Sabbath. In the Exodus version of the commandments, it connects the reason for Sabbath with the creation. God created the world in six days, and then on the seventh day, God rested. But, but in the wording there, it's, it's not simply resting from the labor of the six days. It's, it, it's more like the Sabbath is the culmination of creation. It's not simply a rest day in terms of creation. It is the culmination of creation. This what we experience on the Sabbath day, this life that we have in God, this life with God at the center of it, this sense of, of healing and life and hope that we experience, that we talk about, that we remind each other of on the Sabbath day, this is the culmination. This is what God's creation is supposed to be about. And that's the way that the Exodus connects it. 
But in the version, on the other hand, of the commandments, did you know there's two versions of the commandments? One's in Exodus, one's in Deuteronomy. You should compare the two sometime because they're worded slightly differently. Because in the Deuteronomy version, the reason for Sabbath isn't about the creation. It's instead connected to the Israelites' own slavish work in Egypt. And that's why you take Sabbath now. Because that's where you came from. So now, as a people of God, we take a day off from our labors and our slavish labors, which is great for modern-day Christians to think in those terms, too, because even though Christians have moved Sabbath-keeping to Sunday, the first day of the week, in keeping with Easter, we still rest and we worship and, and we remember God's redemptive activity that continues to be the ways of the Christian community today. And Sabbath-keeping keeps us from idolizing work by, by setting it as a center of value and meaning. It keeps us from getting uh, trapped and caught up in that kind of slavish work week to week and day to day in our to-do list and our work habits and our crazy busy world. That is that kind of slavish place of Egypt. But this Sabbath keeping in terms of Deuteronomy says that that's why you keep Sabbath now, to, to separate yourself from that, to, to get a little perspective on that, that that is not the end all and be all of life. We do not justify ourselves by our job or a busy to-do list or how much we have accomplished this week. We are not slaves to a crazy, busy, and always connected life today. The Sabbath is a concrete symbol that God's saving grace is what redeems and gives value to human life. Not how much we accomplish through our own frantic work. The Sabbath is a regular time to stop striving and stop reaching and grasping, to stop trying to justify ourselves, to stop trying to, 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 to find a, a sense of purpose and meaning and, and self-fulfillment through how much we get done. It is a time to remember having been set free and accepted in the ultimate sense and to know that the chief end of life is not found in our own hard, frantic work or accomplishment, but only in glorifying and enjoying God. So Sabbath keeping is one of the marks of the people of God. So today, and these first four commandments are really about our connection to God. And as we read at the beginning of the commandments, though, it is a connection that began not with us and, and what we do for God, but, but it is something that began with God's own saving action. I am the Lord your God because. I am the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I am the Lord your God. And we love God and we keep God at the center of our lives. We keep the demands of a crazy, busy life and world in perspective because God first loves us. And God redeems us. And God values us. Because all of the rest of that is very conditional, isn't it? We feel like we're trying to earn the world's love or the world's respect or the world's value. But when we live in God's grace and God's love, 
It's something different entirely. And it's free. And it's affirming. So in another sense, today becomes sort of the first of two stewardship sermons too. We think today about how we connect to God and how God feeds us. We gather around the communion table and a table that today represents God's redemption and feeding not only of, of us who are sitting here this morning, but all people, all people that God loves and feeds and surrounds with his grace. God feeds us every day, provides for us our needs, and God also feeds us spiritually through the life and ministry of Christ church. So the second part next week will, will then be about when we think about having been fed at the table of the Lord, fed in the life of Christ church, how we are then called to feed others out of that place of love and grace and giving to be the body of Christ in the world. And that is when we will look at the other six commandments, which are all about loving our neighbors in some very practical ways. Amen. Friends, as we think about God at the center of our lives and all that God has done for us in our own lives, because this is the one that we come to worship, the God who has freed us, the God who has loved us, the God who has fed us, the God who has given us life and hope. So out of that connection, to that God who claims to be our God for those reasons. Let us rise and sing together. You're worthy of my praise.
And in our modern day ways, sometimes that offering is sent electronically over the course of the week and, and all these things. Sometimes you, you give once a month or once a year or once a week, whatever it may be. We, we have all kinds of ways of doing that. But it's interesting to think about what an offering means. And I think uh, as, as Beth got to that point, as we think about these Ten Commandments about loving God and loving our neighbor, kind of the two sides of that, that coin of our faith with God, our walk with God, I, I think the offering too represents both things. Because on the one hand, our offering is a spiritual discipline. It, it's about our connectedness to God. It's about keeping God at the center of our lives. Just like we come to church and that becomes an important part of our week to help us keep God in our minds and, and in the center of our life over the course of the week. Same thing with our giving. I, I think that offering is it, a discipline that helps us to remember that as we as we consider our lives, as we consider our, our income and our bank accounts and all those things that our modern lives involve, we keep God at the center of that too. And giving through an offering out of our sense of faith in God, that's important to us spiritually. That, that discipline of, of offering ourselves, of giving to the church, Giving as an act of faith. <coughs> now, of course, next week we will get to the other part of the Ten Commandments about how we love our neighbors. We love God, that's partly why we give, but we also love our neighbors. And that's the other part that we'll talk about next week and what that offering goes to do through the life and the ministries of our church. But today, let's think about what our offering means as an act of faith, as a, as a spiritual discipline for ourselves to offer part of our, our resources, part of our ourselves, part of our, our, our life, to offer it to God and to keep God at the center of our lives, of our priorities, of our plans. So friends, I invite you to rise this day as we thank God for all that God has given us and done for us, and let us bring to God our offerings. Let us rise and sing together the doxology.
So, Lord, we bring back to you this portion of all that you have given to us. And we ask that you help us to keep you at the center of our lives and of our thoughts and of our priorities. And, Lord, guide us as your church to use these gifts to do your work amongst these people and in this community. For we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated.
sacrifice he's done for us. We gather here to remember how God and his spirit feed us every day and every week. And how God feeds us through the life of this congregation. It is also interesting that today is World Communion Sunday. And that that story of God feeding us is not just about me or you or even us gathered here. But it is a much bigger story of which we are a part. A story that takes place around the world as people like us gather in communities of faith in all kinds of languages and all kinds of places. Because God is feeding people there too. What an amazing story in which we are a part. So friends, this is the Lord's table. It's not my table and your table or our table or the Presbyterian table. It's the Lord's table. And he invites all those who believe in him to share in this feast that God has it is our uh, tradition here of, of recent um, that after I say the prayer, I will invite our serving elders to come forward. And then I will invite all of you to come forward uh, down the center aisle. Um, you will be handed uh, a piece of bread um, to eat. Uh, and then you will be presented a tray. We invite you to take um, one of the cups of juice um, and then return to seat after you have partaken. Friends, these are the gifts of God to the people of God. Let us pray. Blessed are you, our God, O God, of the whole universe, of all life that you have created. Your mercy is everlasting and your faithfulness endures from age to age. We praise you for creating the heavens and the earth. We praise you for creating us in your image. We praise you for bringing the Israelites safely through the sea. We praise you for leading your people through the wilderness to the land of your promise. We praise you for the words and deeds of Jesus Christ, your anointed one. Praise to you for the death and resurrection of Christ and for your spirit poured out on all people. For all these things, O Lord, we praise you. O God of resurrection and new life, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Bless this feast, O Lord. Feed us at this table. Grace your table and this place with your presence. Reveal yourself to us in the breaking of bread and raise us up as the body of Christ in the world. Breathe new life into us. Fill us with the fruits of your spirit. And then, Lord, send us forth, having been fed at your table, out into the world to feed the world around us as the body of Christ. And with all your holy ones of all times and places, with the whole earth and all its creatures, with the sun, the moon, and the stars, we praise you, O God. Blessed be you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Friends, Scripture tells us that on the night of his arrest, our Lord sat at table with his disciples, and during the meal he took the bread, and having given thanks to his Father in heaven, he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. And the same way, after the meal, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes in. I'd like to invite our serving elders to come forward, please.
Friends, I invite you to come and be fed at the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come in peace. Mm -hmm.
graciously made us into living members of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with this spiritual food, the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now, O Lord, into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please rise for our blessing. 